Do better. You have oh, to yeah. Science prize. Yeah. Yeah, my people. Um, listen, we got Singapore our science prize up in here, right? So Boston, show Singapore some love. Let's have an over moment. Singapore, show Boston some love. <laughs> Just so international, man. Just so international. All right, we're going to have a good time this afternoon. Do you guys believe that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We have a very special guest speaker who's come to talk to you about some of the work that he's doing and some of the things that he's thinking. We have today David Sung Kong, our special guest. He is an engineer, entrepreneur, and artist based out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. He received his PhD from the MIT Media Lab, is the founder of a biotechnology company, and currently conducts synthetic biology research at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory. Lincoln Laboratory. Somebody say, wow. 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 Right, that's, that's cool. All right, I'm not doing it. It's not even over. It's only halfway through the paragraph. <laughs> he works actively in the Asian American community as a longtime organizer with Boston Progress Arts Collective. He is also leading the formation of a new arts and community center at East Meets West Bookstore. As a musician, David has performed around the country as a vocalist, beatboxer, DJ, and rapper, and has won numerous awards for vocal arrangement and production. Someone say, that's cool. That's, that's cool. cool. Right? There's not too many rapping synthetic biologists. I just gotta, I just gotta figure, right? There's not, not too many synthetic biologists that can lay down a beat. Okay. He recently discovered his love for photography and has had his work selected for publication in both online and printed media. Art Science Prize, please give a warm welcome. Put your hands together for Mr. David Sun Kong. Right. Our Science Prize. It is such an honor and a privilege to be here speaking with you guys. So amazing that Singapore is in the house, that we got an international crowd today. Um, so cool that you guys are here, and I'm so blessed to be able to uh, uh, speak with you guys. And, um, and yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. I uh, really appreciate it. So um, today, I'm going to be introducing myself to you guys as both a synthetic biologist, um, but also um, as an artist, just period, as an artist. And really, um, one thing I want, an idea that I'm sure you guys think a lot about here at the Art Science Prize, but every single one of you in this room here is an artist. Whether you think about yourselves that way or not, that's actually true. That's how I see you guys, is as, as, as artists. Because fundamentally, what is being an artist about? It's about being creative. It's about, being, it's about expressing yourself. And so, what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today is both synthetic biology, but also tools for creativity. So different things that we as artists use to help express ourselves. So, for example, um, uh, you know, you guys just heard, so I do a bunch of music stuff. I'm also a DJ. Um, so as a DJ, you know, we need really interesting gear and equipment to fill our creative potential as DJs. Um, as a photographer, you need, you know, at a minimum these days, it's cool, you can do a lot of work just with, uh, with your phone, but, you know, you know you, you'd like to have, like, a nice camera with some good lenses, so you need tools. We need tools to fulfill our creative potentials, and today's what I'm going to be talking to you about are some of those tools that um, I work with as a synthetic biologist, um, but also tools in general for, for artists and what we use to help fulfill our creative potentials, whatever they are. Okay. So, to start, um, I wanted to actually, before I dive into the biology, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking just about art and talking about uh, some of the work that I do um, outside of my synthetic biology world, but just as an artist. So, um, uh, as you guys heard, um, one thing I'm doing uh, in Cambridge is I'm also founding uh, an arts, technology, and community center that in a way has got a lot of philosophy that's very similar to what um, the Art Science Prize is all about. And so this actually used to be a bookstore that uh, my, my, family, my family owned. And about a year and a half ago, well we've been holding events there for over eight years, but around a year and a half ago I started getting really serious about turning the whole space into a community center. 
And so this is a photograph that I took of a bunch of my friends. They're called the Jazz Thugs. Um, they're based out of, uh, of uh, Berkeley, the School of Music, so some of you guys may have heard of Berkeley. And um, they're truly some of the great uh, jazz musicians in Boston. These guys play with guys like Kanye West and Lady Gaga. You've probably heard of some of these people. So they're amazing jazz musicians. And you know, what these guys are doing here is, I love this photograph because you see, you know, one a pack crowd and then you see all the musicians and they're in the zone. They're in their element expressing themselves and they're doing their thing being creative. And, um, you know, for me, I, I may look like a young guy. I'm actually, actually just turned 33 years old. I'm a, I'm a 30 plus dude now. And um, for me, you know, it took me a while, but I've come to realize for myself that my purpose, the reason why I'm here, is to try and give people the tools and the resources that they need to fulfill whatever is their, their creative potential. So that could be in synthetic biology, and I'll talk a bunch about that. But also, um, in my work at my community center, this is what I think all the time about, is how do I help create spaces and give the tools for people to be creative, okay? And so, um, so this, I, I love this photograph because you, know, you can really see uh, my friends, these musicians, exploring themselves. Because as a musician, you need a space to be creative, too. It's not just good enough to have an instrument. You need a place and a, and a venue where you can perform. So that's something that I try to do through my, my own community center space. And so, again, as a musician, you know, we play, we have different instruments, you know, for me also, you know, I beatbox and I rap, it's good to have a nice microphone. Um, but for, similarly, in synthetic biology, we also need really great tools. So this is a, a photograph of my friend, uh, Professor Drew Endy. So Drew was a uh, professor at MIT, he's now at Stanford now, he's actually one of the founders of this whole field of synthetic biology. And uh, this is a comic book he created called Adventures in Synthetic Biology. And, um, you know, everybody, all artists, and again, synthetic biologists are artists too. You don't think about biologists necessarily as being artists, but we are. We also need tools to be creative, okay? And so I'll spend a lot of time talking about that. And so again, you know, um, you guys are all in high school. I was in high school uh, in the, in the mid-late 90s. I graduated from high school in 1997. And um, so uh, I'm going to give you guys a bunch of 90s references. I hope you guys don't mind too much, um, but that's kind of the generation I grew up in. And um, you know, if you guys have seen the movie, The Usual Suspects, you guys seen that movie? Oh yeah, it's a good one, right? So they do a, they do a kind of a clever thing in Usual Suspects. It's one of the first movies that does this kind of non-linear story, storytelling style, where they show you the end of the movie at the beginning. Okay, so we're, I'm, I'm going to steal from Usual Suspects and do a little bit of that. Okay, so I'm going to show you an image right now. Um, for now, for this moment, you guys can just look at this thing and go, wow, that thing's crazy, because what is this thing? You see a dime there, and then you see all these crazy tubes and then all these colors. What is this thing? This is like usual suspects. I'm going to show this to you now. You see it, um, but later, by the end of the whole talk, if I do a good job, you'll, you'll know what this thing is and what this is all about. But I'll say one thing about it right now. This thing is called a microfluidic device. Microfluidic device, okay? And uh, by the end of this talk, I'll explain to you what this thing is. But for now, um, I'm just going to start this talk by saying that this is, in my synthetic biology world, this is what I play with. This is, my, this is my tool for creativity. What I use to be creative is uh, microfluidics. Okay, so plant that seed with you guys and we'll go back to the end. So first I'm gonna start off with some um, kind of just general, um, more conversation about my, my work as an artist. And what I wanted to start by doing actually is to show you guys a, um, a little video, um, a collaboration that I did with my dear friend Giles Lee. Giles is uh, the director of programs at the, Bo the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center, the BCNC, some of you may know of it. It's the largest service provider in Chinatown. And Giles is also an amazing spoken word poet. And so last year, um, it being the 10 year anniversary of 9-11, we were asked to put together a, a piece um, kind of memorializing that event with Giles' spoken word poetry put together with my photography. So again, you know, another area that I'm creative as an artist is as a photographer. So I wanted to show you guys a little video showing you a little remixing of uh, poetry plus photography. So this is a little video that we put together. Um, Ashes are an overused poetic trope. Thematic shorthand taken to represent impermanence, the fleeting, the faint, the fickle nature of nature, the dying heartbeats, last few breaths before silence, ashes, the reflection of the sun off the moon, the death of stars, the death of passion, the death of a cigarette, of a flame, of being, of course, ashes, the way they float in your eyesight, near, far, Fictional. It's almost like you can predict their path of flight, like aimless guardian angels, and you, their lost cause. They are ashes. Make appearance on your forehead every year before Easter. A mass of us reclaiming our only personal spaces for public announcements. A declaration to the world. Ashes. Jump. Heat and screeches under our feet, moving us ever forward. They pull us off and on subway trains, help us navigate this city as we burrow through its belly. Ashes. 
have fallen from the clouds for the past 10 years, erase the images in our memories like flickering movie projectors in abandoned cinemas, these ashes in our eyes and lungs and hearts that held answers for all the questions we barely had right to ask, now ashes embedded in our stomach linings and our throats as though the glow of our insides are just so much smoke. These ashes that we hold in our hands, they slip through our knuckles, catch the air they escaped from, and fly, imprisoned again by their own birth and rebirth. Ashes in the sky, the ensuing clamor and calamity, the rare calm air through which each smoldering droplet cut and burned, this life these times, skies are now black, the world is at war, and we have risen, broken, from these ashes. All right, so, oh, thank you. So really, uh, my boy Clouds, you can hear, he's got a hypnotic voice. Um, you should check his stuff out on YouTube, actually. He's got a bunch of really amazing work. Um, and so uh, I show you that video again to kind of spark this idea in your mind. One, you know, just in terms of life and how you develop yourself. Um, you know, for me personally, I really kind of came into my own self and really embracing the fact that I am a photographer, I am a DJ, and I am a synthetic biologist. And now for me, I'm starting to find all the parallels between those different art forms, and hopefully we'll get into a little bit of that today. So again, I want to show you just a, before I dive into biology, I wanted to show you a little bit more some of the artwork that I've done, some of the photography work that I've done, and kind of hopefully touch a little bit about that idea again about tools for creativity. As artists, we need tools, okay? So first, I just want to show you a couple of images. So um, one thing that's kind of interesting about all the photos that are part of that other piece, uh, you'll notice there are no people in those pieces, those, those photographs. It was all kind of images of objects or nature, cityscape. And so to me, there are kind of four different types of photography. Okay. Um, one of them is basically a cityscape or a landscape where you, know, you can kind of take your time, the city's there, it's not moving any place, the, uh, you know, the landscape is there, you can photograph it and it's not going to go anywhere. And so you, there's a kind of a special type of uh, photography that's, and a mindset that's involved when you take those types of photos. But the next set of photos I'm going to show you, this is more um, an area that I really love, which is actually photographing other artists. Okay, so it's kind of like a, a sort of a meta thing where you know I myself am an artist, but I'm now photographing other artists doing their thing, and that is kind of another level of depth that I really enjoy. And so this is my friend uh, Marsha Lubin. She's another amazing R&B singer and jazz musician. Um, this is her performing at the Beehive, and so I love this photograph. You can really see the the the, the uh, incredible kind of angst and uh, grief in her face, and then in the same song you can see the same uh, you know expression of grace and beauty that she has. So, this is Marsha. Um, this is my friend, uh, Brenda Wong Aoki. Um, she was performing, this was in Minnesota at a spoken word summit. Um, and you can see Brenda, she's got this incredible fierceness about her. And she's amazing too, because she's one of the first um, Asian American artists of our generation. Asian Americans, we've been here for about, in the, in the US for about 100 years or so maybe, but uh, Brenda's one of kind of our first real artists um, from the 1940s and 50s. And then, um, these are two of my friends. This is Robert Karimi and Yalani Dream. Um, they're also poets and actors, and again, you can see this incredible expression that they have as they perform and they do their thing. So, so again, photographing artists is another kind of uh, level of depth that I personally really enjoy as an artist. And um, um, now I want to shift a little bit. So still looking at different artists and them doing their thing, but again, now shifting back into this idea about tools for creativity, okay? So I don't know if you guys know who this is. Um, this is Questlove from the Mighty Roots crew. So again, I go back to my 90s references. I grew up on a lot of 90s hip hop music, so um, the Roots were a big influence for me when I was at your, your guys' age. Um, Questlove is also a DJ in, in addition to being an incredible drummer. So this is him performing in Boston. And you can see, you know, in contrast to those other performing artists, this dude is in a zone. He's just like looking so fiercely at his equipment and his gear. And uh, you know, for me, also as a DJ, I really relate to this because um, you know, in addition to being a DJ, I want to say on a higher level, I'm a big nerd. Like, that's just a big thing about me is that I'm a real big nerd. I know there are a lot of nerds in the house, too, if you guys uh, are, are doing synthetic biology and, and science. And uh, Questlove is also a really big nerd. And he loves gear, he loves equipment, he loves technology. And you can see, for him, he is just, right now he's doing something we, we do as DJs called beat matching, where you take two songs and you try to blend them together. And so, there's an incredible technical focus that you have as a DJ when you're focusing on your equipment. And again, this is one of the tools that as a DJ we use to be creative. And um, you can see, uh, you can see that, that look in, in, in uh, Questlove's eyes. And so this is one of, uh, another photograph I took in, in, uh, in New York of, uh, of another uh, pretty famous rapper. This guy's name is Q-Tip. You guys know Q-Tip? Woo! Yeah. Woo! Yeah. 
Q-tip, again, uh, you know, I'm dating myself, but this is a, he's from a 90s group called The Tribe Called Quest, which again, another hip hop group that I grew up on. And, uh, and Q-tip, again, he's an amazing rapper, but he's also a DJ. So again, you see this a lot, too. You see a lot of these different artists that you might, you might know and love, but once you start exploring one art form, you start to see, you know, it becomes a lot easier to start thinking about other types of art forms as well. And so again, you can see Q-tip, you know, he's got his two turntables, he's trying to blend two songs together, and he's got this incredible technical focus that as a DJ you have to have when you're trying to beat match two songs or do a blend or a crossfade. And so um, it's a different type of artistic expression, but you know, he's still very much an artist created, creating and doing his thing. And so, so yes, yeah, so I love that, that element of the gear, you know, all the technology that you need to be a DJ. And then this is finally just a picture of the two, uh, two of them together, Questlove and Q-Tip together. Um, I'm going to close with one final photograph just because I think this is kind of a cool photo that I took. This is me and my two friends um, in, in Los Angeles and LA. Um, we go to the same spot every year and we always take a photograph together. So that's my friend Chucky. Chucky is another person who's a writer, um, but also an amazing virtuoso bass guitarist and, play, and musician. Uh, so he also explores, explores many types of art forms. And then my friend Vu, who is an R&B singer, he also went to MIT with me. So he's a big technical nerd, he's an electrical engineer. He likes to build electronics, but he's also an incredible R&B singer. So um, again, you know, we're, we're, you know, I feel a real kinship and brotherhood with them because you know, in addition to kind of being nerds in a more traditional way, we also explore ourselves artistically in other ways as well. So, all right, so I'm gonna shift gears now. And again, keep this idea in your mind about tools for creativity. What are the tools that we need to be creative? And I'm gonna pop out of this and I'm going to now play you guys a little interview. So, so now, um, a couple days ago uh, in Boston, um, we have this great radio station called uh, NPR, National Public Radio. If you guys don't listen to it, you should check it out. Yeah, it's a great radio station. Um, so they interviewed just three days ago um, a colleague of mine, in fact, Professor George Church from Harvard Medical School. Okay? So George Church, along with Drew Endy, these guys are some of the real kind of uh, foremost thinkers in synthetic biology. And so uh, they interviewed George, and I just want to play you guys the start of this, uh, this interview here. This is Radio Boston. I'm Anthony Brooks. And I'm Megna Chakrabarty. So this morning in our editorial meeting, we were talking about the segment you're about to hear. And all of the excitement was about the unbridled possibilities that come with genome engineering, specifically things like Jurassic Park coming true, woolly mammoths, dinosaurs, and other prehistoric giants cloned back to life and once again walking the earth. But our guest today says developments in biotechs will be even more spectacular than that. He says a scientific revolution is underway that could solve the global energy crisis, eliminate all human diseases, and transform everything about how we live. Imagine a future where growing a new home is as easy as planting a new seed in the ground. That could be the future, and it's closer than you think. Of course, with any great leap in science and technology, the new world of genetic engineering comes freighted with profound ethical and moral challenges. And these challenges may be the biggest humankind has ever dealt with, because what the genomics revolution promises is nothing short of remaking life itself. And George Church is one of the people who knows just how close this, this unimaginable future is. I'm going to pause that right there. So that was pretty serious. That was pretty serious what, uh, what uh, Megna Chakravarti was there was saying about uh, genome engineering and synthetic biology. So I'm gonna take a second here just to go backwards and uh, unpackage a little bit of what she said because that was serious stuff. So Jurassic Park, Willie Mammoth. But she said some things, some key words that I'm gonna kind of hone in on and we'll spend a little time talking about each one of these. So one, so we're gonna do kind of a, a hype check and a reality check, okay? So I work in this field so I can give you guys a, a, a bit of both, you know? So she was talking a lot about the promises of synthetic biology, genomic engineering, scientific revolution. Is that true? Um, I would say yes. I would say yes. And hopefully you guys will agree with me too as we get into some of the nitty gritty of some of the biology and the technology that's being developed. Um, and then she made a couple of other really interesting claims. She said potentially synthetic biology can help to solve the global energy crisis. Wow, how are we going to do that with biology? That's pretty interesting. And I'll give you guys a little bit of some examples of how we might think about solving the energy crisis with biology. Um, eliminate all human diseases, another big claim. Wow, can you imagine that, a world without disease, and hopefully we can use synthetic biology to, to get us there. Big claim. Um, and then transforming everything about how we live. This is pretty serious stuff, this is really heady stuff. And so 
What I'm going to do now is kind of dive into some of this actual uh, technology that we use in these areas, and we can see for ourselves how real uh, some of these claims are. And, um, but I will say this, though. Um, overall, I do agree with the promise. I do agree with the promise, and then hopefully through things like the Art Science Prize and you guys being stimulated and your imaginations coming alive, thinking about these problems, you guys can be a part of helping to make these uh, visions come true and helping to really uh, make real some of these different um, ideas that we have in biology. Okay? So, um, so I'm going to spend a second on this. So this is, this is really uh, kind of one of the more beautiful ideas when people ask me about synthetic biology. If I think about it in a, in a, in a sentence or in, in one image, what I like to think about synthetic biology is we're trying to develop technologies so that you could literally take a seed plant it into the ground, and then grow a house, okay? When you really think about it that way, that's kind of a, a mind-blowing thought, that you could somehow re-engineer a seed, plant it into the ground, and grow into an object that we as humans have designed. That's a really powerful idea, and there's a lot to kind of unpackage into how you would actually do that, all right? How would you actually do that? And so one thing I want to really hammer into your guys' minds today is, if we were to make something like this happen, if we were to make some transformation between a seed and a house to happen, the thing that we, the molecule, the single molecule that's most important that we think about most as synthetic, bi synthetic biologists is DNA, okay? DNA. Ultimately, all of the functions that we would encode into that seed that would allow it to grow into a house, they all come from the DNA. All the functions are ultimately encoded, encoded in this one molecule. Now, a lot of you guys, through your, your course and your study, I'm sure you spent a lot of time thinking about DNA, but I really want to kind of hammer into it, hammer this idea home with you guys that the DNA is the molecule that we spend so much time in our lab designing and building and thinking about is this molecule of DNA, okay? So, first I want to start off with a, a metaphor to help you guys wrap your minds about what DNA is in a cell, in a living thing, and how, how it functions. So you guys all play with computers. Um, everybody here, you guys probably have like a Mac or maybe a Windows, and you guys know about these operating systems, right? So, you know, we've got the OS X, the Snow Leopard. I don't know why Mac is obsessed with like these cat things. You know, they got a mountain lion and panther and all this stuff, but that's, you know, Macintosh's thing. And then we got Windows, you know, with this new Windows 8 operating system. And so, what does an operating system do? An operating system has basically, inside of it, all of the instructions that tell a computer how to work, okay? Without the operating system, the computer would not function, would not know what to do. And all the really kind of the basic instructions for how a computer functions are built into the operating system, okay? And so in a real similar way, we can think about DNA in a very similar way in that the DNA has all of the instructions encoded inside it, just like the operating system of the computer that can tell, in this case, human cells how to grow, how to metabolize. All of the instructions are encoded in the DNA. And the reason here I have a cell and not a whole human being, and this is part of the synthetic biology reality check, okay? So, you know, we talked a lot about, or Megan Chakrabarty, she was talking about, you know, Jurassic Park and, you know, dinosaurs and stuff. We're not anywhere near really doing anything like that. The reality check is most of the work we do with synthetic biology is, about, is at the cellular level. We're really looking at cells. And in fact, it's usually single cells. And even backing up another step, it's actually usually bacteria, okay, that we're usually thinking about playing with in synthetic biology. Single cells, all right, so that's why I put cell up here instead of a whole organism. Hopefully by the time you guys, uh, you know, come to college, go to grad school, we will be thinking more on the tissue and the organism level, but for right now, um, the technology is mostly about cells. Okay, so DNA, again, this is the real kind of core molecule that has all of the instructions for how these living things operate. So I'm gonna spend a little time talking about DNA and the different sizes, so you can think about orders of magnitude of DNA and what, what those kind of correlate and map to. So, you guys know what a gene is, right? You guys know the, single, the, the central dogma of biology, right? We know that uh, gene, is transcribed into um, RNA, which is then trans translated into a protein, right? That's kind of the central dogma of, uh, of, the, of uh, biology. And so normal single genes are around 100 or 1,000 or you know, some really, really weird big genes are like 10,000 base pairs, okay, for a single gene, which then encodes for a single protein, okay? I'm gonna spend a bunch of time today talking about these things called genetic circuits, and I'll explain in a little greater, greater detail what those are. But those are generally pieces of DNA that have not just a single gene, but multiple genes, okay, together, stitched together into one big piece of DNA. And this thing's a genetic circuit. These things are typically like ten, about tens of thousands of bases, okay? Genetic circuits. And now, once you start getting to up to 100,000 bases, really interesting stuff starts to happen. You can start thinking about this concept called minimal life. What is minimal life? So what minimal life is, 
is the smallest amount of DNA you need inside an organism for that organism to grow and self-replicate, okay? For that organism to grow and self-replicate. So the minimum amount of DNA, the minimum amount of instructions that you need in a DNA molecule is about 500,000 bases. So there's this organism called the mycogen mycoplasma genitalium, okay? Mycoplasma genitalium. That thing has a genome that's about 580,000 base pairs in size, and that's the smallest genome that we're aware of um, for an organism that can grow and replicate on its own. Okay, so, so here basically, single genes up to an actual living thing. There's only a couple orders of magnitude of DNA size, actually, it's interesting. Um, and then finally, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking also today about microbial genomes. So, in particular, a type of bacteria called E. coli. You guys have heard of E. coli before, right? Yeah, so E. coli has a genome that's about um, uh, five or six million bases or so. Okay, so this is kind of the scale. So, a couple thousand, you start thinking about genes, all the way up to uh, minimal life, and then um, actual bacteria, entire bacterial genomes. Okay, so now let's back, back up into the overall structure again. And the first topic I'm gonna spend a little time on is solving the global energy crisis. And how are we gonna use synthetic biology, our ability to manipulate DNA, and to think about solving this global energy crisis. All right, so again, this is our friend E. coli. E. coli is, uh, is a really fun bacteria. We, it, in a lot of ways, it gets a bad rap. You think about E. coli a lot of times, you think about it from, you hear about it in terms of like food poisoning. You know, somebody, somebody got E. coli and got food poisoning. Well, it turns out for us as synthetic biologists, and again, going back to this idea about tools for creativity, E. coli is one of our favorite tools. It's one of the favorite things that we use in the lab to try and do interesting, cool things in synthetic biology. And the metaphor, the way you guys can think about it is, we think about E. coli in many ways the way engineers think about a factory. Okay? So we use factories to build and manufacture things, and in a very similar way as synthetic biologists, we use E. coli to actually build and make things. And what are the, some of the things that we like to build and make? We like to make medicines, we like to make new materials, and then the thing I'm gonna talk a little bit about right now is fuel, actual fuel. So we can actually re-engineer these E. coli starting at the DNA level, because really, again, it's all about the DNA. We can rewrite the DNA of these organisms so that they can actually generate real petroleum. And actually, this is becoming a very large industry that people are really starting to use right now. It's one of the kind of um, examples of commercial success in synthetic biology is reorganizing bacteria to create fuel. And so this is, um, um, we're gonna get a little extra nerdy now. So this is a, uh, um, a publication in this uh, journal called Nature. So once you guys, uh, you know, if you guys decide you wanna be an academic and get to grad school, it's good to publish in these fancy journals called Nature and Science and Cell. Um, but this is a paper that came out in Nature last year on the microbial production of fatty acid delivered fuels and chemicals from plant biomass. Wow, it's a big mouthful. But basically what this means is, these synthetic biologists have actually gone into the bacteria at the, at the DNA level, have, re, have basically created DNA that they put inside the E. coli to give the E. coli new instructions. And those instructions are, hey E. coli, if we give you some plant mass, basically we give you some sugar, okay, you're gonna be able to convert that plant matter and turn it into uh, fuel for us, okay? And so that's kind of what this little image is showing is, these molecules coming in and then coming out as the type of fuel that we want, okay? So, so this is something that's real, that's happening. There are actually a number of companies that are, are doing this, and you're gonna only hear really more about this as time goes on. Um, and I, I wanna spend one just quick second on bacteria, because I think bacteria are really cool. So this is actually something that came out in a Scientific American um, uh, just uh, earlier, a couple months ago, about, um, our, about something called the microbiome. Okay, so you guys have heard about the genome, right? Which is basically all the genes that we have in the body. You've heard about the proteome, which is all the proteins in the body. Well, there's something that actually, um, as humans, we have called the microbiome. And this thing really kind of blew my mind. So you think about yourselves as an individual walking around. Um, you are actually carrying on your bodies about 10 trillion bacteria. Okay, or sorry, 100 trillion bacteria. So you as a human, you are made of about 10 trillion, 10 trillion cells. And bacteria actually have you actually are carrying around on you 100 trillion bacteria, okay? So the number of bacteria that are on you actually outnumber the number of human cells that you are made of 10 to one. So you are actually more bacteria than human right now as we speak, okay? And what's crazy is, you know, we don't have, you know, um, our eyes and our hands are, and our way of sensing and looking at the world are so, so we can't see these bacteria, okay? But they're there and there are lots of them, all right? And so this is something that we as scientists are just starting to learn and really understand about how closely coupled we are with these bacteria. 
And it's cool, you know, um, you know Dashan was showing me earlier some of the really cool little ecosystems you guys are building there um, over on the piano. And actually, you guys are a walking ecosystem. And what we're starting to understand more about bacteria and how they interact with us as humans is that actually when you get sick, a lot of times you think that, oh, you get sick and your own immune system is what's helping you get better. It's actually not just that. It's actually a combination of your own immune system plus all of the bacteria that are part of your own microbiome. Okay? So this is something that we're just starting to really wrap our minds around as scientists. So I just wanted to plant that little seed in your guys' minds because it's a really cool, um, cool area that people really started to think about bacteria and how they interact with humans. Okay. So now, going back to our big picture again, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we might use synthetic biology to help cure disease. Okay. How are we going to cure disease with synthetic biology? All right. So um, I'm not going to expect any of you guys to know what the heck this thing is. I didn't even know what this thing was, um, you know, a couple of months ago. But um, I want to start though, just and again, this is going to be kind of usual suspect style. You'll look at it now. You're not going to know what this is, but I'll explain to you in a minute. But I want you to focus on this thing that I circled here. This M I R X. I'm actually going to take my jacket off and start getting a lot. <laughs> Man. Right lights, right lights. All right. So this thing is called is a molecule or represents a molecule called a microRNA. Okay. Have you guys ever heard about a microRNA? It's probably not. I actually didn't even really know about microRNAs until very recently. And so um, in a way, you know, I'm going to bring out back the '90s again as a reference. So you know, I grew up watching uh, uh, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. You guys ever seen the Fresh Prince of Bel Air before? Yeah. yeah. Of course. All right. Good. I'm not too old. Good. So, um, you know, basically, you know, so far in this talk, I've given a lot of love to DNA. So much love to DNA. DNA gets all the love. But actually, microRNAs, they're another type of nucleic acid in our bodies. Those are also extremely important molecules. And so, you know, even though DNA, DNA is kind of like, you know, Will Smith gets all the love, microRNAs are just as important. And they're like DJ Jazzy Jeff. <laughs> DJ Jazzy Jeff, Will Smith is nothing without DJ Jazzy Jeff. And the DNA is nothing without the microRNA. Okay, so these things are really, really important spend a little bit of time talking about microRNAs and what they have to do with synthetic biology and then what they have to do with medicine, okay? So, these are, this is an image of a bunch of cancer cells, okay? So, cancer is a really serious topic. Um, you know, my own, my own aunt, she passed away from cancer. I'm sure almost everybody in this room has a family member or a friend, somebody's been touched by cancer. It's one of the big diseases of our lifetime and we spend, as synthetic biologists, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to cure cancer, okay? And so one really cool um, thing that's been happening is we've been looking at these molecules, these microRNA molecules. And again, these all basically are, represent different types of microRNAs, MIR21, MIR17, whatever. These are all different ways that we as biologists think about categorizing these molecules. Okay? But the idea that I want to get into your guys' head right now is that every cell in our body produces these microRNAs. And what's amazing about these microRNAs is that just by looking at a few of them, just five or six microRNAs, and if we know the amounts of the microRNA inside a cell, we can actually identify that cell as cancer. We can use the microRNAs as basically like a fingerprint, like a signature. If we can measure the microRNAs of just a few, just a handful, five or six inside of a cell, we can actually say this cell is cancer or this cell is not cancer. Okay? So basically that's it. You can think about it for the purposes of today, the microRNAs are a fingerprint. There's, they're, they're a way for us to tell whether or not a cell is cancer or not cancer, just by measuring the amounts of a very small number of them, okay? So let's go back to this crazy thing again. So this thing, um, you know, again, I've circled the, the microRNA part, the MIRX thing up there, but this whole thing is what we call a genetic, I call a genetic circuit, okay? So I showed you guys before that, you know, that whole little kind of timeline showing the different sizes of DNA. Genetic circuits are around 10,000 or so base pairs in size. And basically, for today's purposes, you can basically think about the genetic circuit as a program, a DNA program. So again, when you think about computers, we run programs all the time in, um, in computers. But here, we're actually running a program inside of a cell. All right, and how does that happen? So this actual uh, little, little graphical representation is actually um, uh, a schematic of a representation of actual DNA. And so this piece of DNA, you can think about this whole thing as a piece of DNA. This DNA, we can actually put inside of a cell through a process called transfection, okay? You actually take a physical DNA molecule, you put it inside the cell, and then we actually run a program, a biological program inside that cell through that genetic circuit, okay? And what we're doing is we're asking the genetic circuit, once it's inside the cell, it's asking, 
hey cell, how much microRNA do you have? Okay, it's asking a really simple question of that cell. So again, this genetic circuit is a program. We put that thing inside the actual physical um, a cell, and then the genetic circuit starts asking the cell a question. And in this case, it's asking how much microRNA do you have? Okay, how much microRNA do you have? Now, this is an example of another genetic circuit. This one's an even crazier genetic circuit than the one I just showed you. And this one actually has five different microRNAs, or yeah, five different microRNAs that are being shown up here, okay? And so, if we take this thing, and again, Remember, microRNAs are a fingerprint. Mi microRNAs are a signature. They're a way for us to tell what is and is not a cancer cell. Okay? We can take this genetic circuit, and what it does is when we put it inside of a cell, it actually measures the microRNA levels of each one of these five microRNA levels inside the cell. And so in doing so, the genetic circuit is actually asking the cell, hey cell, are you cancer? Okay? It's actually asking the cell whether or not it's a cancer cell or not, just by measuring these, uh, these specific five microRNAs, okay? And so what um, this collaborator of mine at uh, MIT, his name is Professor Ron Weiss, what he did, he published this really amazing paper in this magazine called Science um, last year. He took these genetic circuits and he put them inside a bunch of cells, a bunch of cancers, uh, and these cells were par partially cancerous and partially not cancerous. And what he did was, these genetic circuits, once they're inside all these cells, they ask the cell a question, hey cell, are you cancer or are you not cancer? And what it would do is, it would actually, in the case where um, the cancer came back, yes, you are cancer, it would actually kill the cell. It would initiate a process called apoptosis and kill the cell. So imagine that, isn't that amazing? You take a genetic circuit, put it into a whole bunch of cells, you don't know beforehand if it's cancer or not. And then the genetic circuit itself, this piece of DNA, once it's inside the cell, asks that cell that question, are you a cancer cell or not a cancer cell? And if it is, it'll actually kill that cell, okay? And so this was published, in a, again, in this, this uh, really nice journal called Science. It's a, it's a complicated uh, title, Multi-Input RNAi-Based Logic Circuit for Identification of Specific Cancer Cells. But what that means is what I just told you, okay? It's a genetic circuit, you put it in the cell, it asks how many microRNAs there are, and through that question, it's really asking, are you cancer or are you not cancer? And if it is cancer, you can actually kill that cell, okay? So it's almost like a search and destroy little, uh, little machine for, uh, for cancer. But the whole thing is made out of DNA, all right? So, so through technology like this and tools like this, this is how we can start thinking about actually curing certain types of diseases using synthetic biology, okay? And so I showed you this one genetic circuit. That's cool, one, one is cool. But three is even cooler. And having a whole bunch of these, having libraries of these things is even better. And so one thing I want to plant with you guys right now is the idea that we don't want just one, we want libraries of these circuits to ask cells all kinds of interesting questions. So we don't want to ask just, are you, are you cancer, or are you not cancer, or how much microRNA you, you, are, you have, et cetera. We want to be able to ask cells all kinds of questions about, um, about them, and we can do that using these genetic circuits. And so I'll explain a little bit more about this uh, later on, but what I work on right now is building libraries of these types of genetic circuits that can ask cells all kinds of interesting questions. And so for you guys in, your, in the Art Science Prize, what you guys are thinking about, just, you know, this is a really cool thing to keep in mind, that we can actually create these little DNA programs that when you put them inside a cell, we can, we, can, we can be really inquisitive. We can explore and ask questions through these genetic circuits, okay? So, <clears throat> again, oh, what's going on next? Okay, so, so this thing is, uh, again, a little map showing you all the DNA that we're interested in. Again, I spent all this time talking about genetic circuits. And that piece of DNA, again, around 10,000 bases, that's the thing we put inside the cell to ask it interesting questions. But one question, um, again, going back to tools for creativity, how do we make these things? How do we actually synthesize this DNA in the first place, right? So, you know, it's hopefully I've convinced you now that the DNA is really important, but how do we make these molecules? How do we actually synthesize the DNA? And so this actually is one of the tools that as synthetic biologists we use, and this thing is called a DNA synthesizer, all right? And literally, it doesn't look that fancy, but it's a pretty amazing tool. Um, those bottles that you see are actually literal bottles that have the nucleotides A, G, C, and T inside them, okay? And this machine, what it does is it executes a cycle, a type of chemistry. It's called Solid phase phosphoramidite chemistry. It sounds really fancy. If you're interested, if you're a chemist nerd and you want to learn more about it, you should look at, read uh, Marvin Carruthers' papers. But basically what this thing does is, it takes these A's, G's, C's, and T's, 
and adds them, strings them together to build synthetic molecules of DNA. All right? And I want to say, and especially emphasize this point here about synthetic DNA. So people have heard a lot, you know, even Jurassic Park in the 90s, about genetic engineering. Well, all of that engineering that's happening with biology is all it's starting with a natural template. In other words, we take DNA that's out there in nature someplace, either human DNA or you know, sheep DNA, whatever it is, and we do these different things to it. We start cutting and pasting, and I'm sure this is something you guys will be talking a lot about um, in your work here in this, our science prize. We can do a lot of things to remix these pieces of DNA. What's amazing about this machine is that we can actually start building completely user-designed DNA without any previous template. In other words, we're starting completely from scratch. We don't need anything from nature to start making DNA with this machine. All we need are these bottles of A, G, C, and T, where we can start making our own DNA. You can design your own DNA, and this thing essentially manufactures it um, into, uh, into the piece of DNA that you want. And you, so using a machine like this, you can start the process of building your own genetic circuit, which you can put into a cell to have it ask questions, right? So, now we get to the end of the talk, all right? So, we go back, this is like usual suspects, this is like the end of the movie now. I'm gonna explain again what the heck this thing is. And I, want, and I told you before, this thing is called a microfluidic device. Right? What is a microfluidic device? And I wanna say really quickly, actually, this particular one um, allows us to grow and select bacteria, okay? So inside all of those crazy little channels, um, there are actually bacteria growing inside this device. Okay, and I'll explain a little bit more about what this thing is, microfluidics, right? And again, for me, this is my major tool that I use to be created as a synthetic biologist, so microfluidics. So what the heck is this thing? All right, so I'm gonna start off with a metaphor. So 1946, okay? Um, you guys probably can't even conceive in 1946, it was so long ago, but this thing, this thing right here is the first computer, okay? The first computer. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a picture of this before, but this is the first general purpose computer. And look at that thing. That, this computer is called the ENIAC. This thing was the size of a room, and it took multiple people to operate, okay? And now, and now if you think about where we're at today, 2012, we got this, even better. We got these things. Now, can you imagine that? In, 50, in 60 years, we've gone from a computer that was the size of a room, and we shrunk the entire computer down, and now, I'm guessing even in this room, most of you are probably carrying a little computer in your pocket. You might call it a phone, and it's funny that we call these things phones, but really, they're not phones. They're really computers, okay? And almost every, you know, these days, they're, they're a commodity now. Most people have access to these tools, and you carry around a computer in your pocket. And 60 years ago, a computer was the size of a room. It could barely tell you 2 plus 2 equals 4, okay? So we've come a long way. And the thing I want to kind of, the concept I want to embed in your guys' minds here is that what, what, let, what helped us to get from here to here was a process of miniaturization. We took all of the components that are part of this big, huge computer here, and we shrunk them down into a little tiny computer that you can now carry in your pocket, okay? So what does that have to do with microfluidics? So this right now is your biology lab, okay? And again, just like the computer, right? You have all kinds of tools and equipment, lots of people working inside of it, and um, lots of different pieces of machinery that do all kinds of different functions, right? And what we're doing now in microfluidics is exactly the analogy with uh, uh, the phone. We're taking that whole lab and we're shrinking it down into this little tiny device. Okay, and I'm gonna show you, after the, at the end of this talk, for those of you guys who are interested, you can come up and check these out, but I've got a couple of these with me. And literally, they're like a microscope slide. It's like this big, but this is a whole biology lab. Okay, is in this little thing that I'm holding in my hand right here. Okay, and so basically what we can do is we can take so many of the processes that we're doing at the bench top Okay, and we can miniaturize them and shrink them down into a little chip like that. That's the size of a coach's stick, the size of a quarter, basically. Okay, and one of the things that I work on, again, you know, I'm trying to connect all the dots here for you guys, is synthesizing DNA. The process of making that genetic circuit that we can use to have a, a, a microbe create fuel, fuel, or to have a, uh, um, you know, to help cure cancer, we make those circuits inside little chips like this and inside little devices that I'm holding in my hand right now. And again. When this is all over, you guys, if you, those of you who are interested, can come up and check these out. I'll show you. Uh, so in a phrase, um, again, one phrase, if you want to think about microfluidics, the one phrase you can think about is lab on a chip. We're taking this whole biology lab and we're putting it into a little chip that's this size. Okay? Lab on a chip. All right. So again, we go back to our DNA synthesizer, this tool right here. And what I've done in my research, in my PhD research, was to make a microfluidic DNA synthesizer. So you can't really see it, but those are actually my fingers holding this little chip right here, okay? So I took this big hole in a huge machine like this, and I shrunk it down into a little chip that I could hold in my hand. And so we published a paper about this thing 
um, parallel gene synthesis in a microfluidic nucleus. This is one of my uh, pa uh, papers that I published when I was a graduate student at the Media Lab at MIT. Um, so, so yeah, so this thing is pretty cool. So this is another example of a microfluidic device. And again, I should, I should say really quickly, these devices, and the one even that I have right here, it's made out of a, a polymer called polydimethylsiloxane, okay, PDMS. Um, it sounds really crazy, but you guys are actually have probably played with PDMS before. Have you guys ever played with Silly Putty before? You guys know what Silly Putty is? So Silly Putty, actually, the major ingredient in Silly Putty is PDMS, okay? And people actually use PDMS also like weatherproof their homes and stuff like that. So it's a very common material. But um, as a as a microfluidic engineer, I spent a lot of time playing with this uh, with this polymer. And so, basically, what I'm doing with this type of device, and again, the whole concept is a lab on a chip. We can actually manufacture genes and proteins in a device like this. And what's really cool is, so you can't really see it too well. Hopefully, you can. But you know, right now here's a little the blue circle and the red are intersecting. So at that at that intersection is something called a valve. Okay, so basically you can think about it like this. If you have a garden hose, you know, on your lawn, spraying water, if you want to stop the flow in that garden hose, you know, what are some of the ways you can do it? A really easy way to do it is just step on it. If you step on the garden hose, you'll stop the flow, okay? And this is exactly what we're doing in this device here. I actually have a channel right here that has blue fluid in it, and I've got another channel with the red fluid. This red fluid is actually on top of the blue, and so I can actually press down and stop the flow in the blue channel by applying pressure from the red channel. Okay? And I'll show you a little video of how this thing actually functions. So, so this is basically um, the device in action. All right? and what's amazing is all of those valves that I was just describing, I can control all of them with a the computer. Okay? So this whole process is happening automatically. I basically run a computer program and this is happening. But basically the idea that we're doing here is I'm introducing all of the different fluids that I need to build genes. Okay? I won't get into the details of the biology, but suffice it to say, I'm building a blue-green gene, a green gene, and a red gene, or protein, or excuse me, proteins that will fluoresce in those colors. Okay, and then after we build the genes, what we do is we then synthesize the proteins. I won't get into the gory guts and details of it, but suffice it to say, we build the gene up here, and then what you're about to see down here is we're actually going to synthesize a protein. So that yellow mixture is something called a cell-free expression mixture. It's basically you take the guts of a cell, cut it open. Um, and you can actually use that to help synthesize protein. But for now, you can just, just you know, kind of admire the fact that, that with these devices, we can do some really cool manipulations. And again, this whole device is like this size. This is a, I use a microscope to show you this image, but this whole chip is like this big. I hold it, you know, it's just a couple inches in my hand. And I'll show you one other thing that's kind of cool. You can actually mix fluids. So you see up there, the blue and the yellow, and now they're mixing. And you can kind of see that little flickering up there that's happening. So that's a valve moving really, really, really fast. And actually, if you put three valves together, so there's one up there, there's one over here, and one over here, and you kind of see them flickering, those three valves moving like this allows you to pu pu uh, pump and move fluids around, okay? And so again, the volume here is about 12 nanoliters, okay? Nanoliters. So you know you got your two liter bottle of Coke, right? So this is about a billion times smaller than that, okay? So you can think about like a drop of water uh, from your shower or whatever. This is like a tiny fraction of a drop of water that's, that's being manipulated and moved inside here. Okay? And using this type of an architecture, the device like this, we can not only build genes, but we can also build proteins. So this is a glowing protein called green fluorescent protein. And fluorescent, it glows green. So what's kind of amazing about this device is, basically I put into it little bits of DNA and a little bit of this kind of cell-free expression mixture. Right? You put in a bunch of ingredients, and then the whole thing acts like a factory. It manufactures the gene, and then expresses that gene to give you a functional green protein. Okay, and that all happens completely automated, um, computer control. Okay, so this is some of the stuff that I work on in the lab. So, and again, we can use technology like this, and again, we'll go back here. This is another example of a device that I made. And this thing has 256 reactors, okay? That allows me to build 256 different genetic circuits. So again, I was telling you guys about genetic circuits that we use to help ask uh, cells whether or not they're cancer or not. We can build 256 different kinds of, uh, of um, genetic circuits using this type of device. And so, you know, that's really what, what gets us back over to, you know, Will Smith, Jazzy Jeff, and, and the microRNA. So we can actually build these different types of microRNA um, genetic circuit libraries with a device like this, okay? So again, microfluidic assembly of genetic circuit libraries. That's what we're doing in this microfluidic device here. And again, um, I'll bring this back again to this idea about tools for creativity. And this is one of the big tools that I use in my lab to help uh, myself 
um, express myself fully with synthetic biology through these genetic circuits. And so I'll close now with uh, just a couple of quick little videos. Um, again, final question, how do we build microfluidics? Okay? And I wanted to show you guys um, a couple of uh, videos here that I think are pretty cool. So um, again, you know, I'm a, I'm a, oh, actually, I'll show you one thing first. So this thing is called a 3D printer. You guys ever heard of a 3D printer before? Anybody? A couple of you have? Oh, a lot of you have. Okay, very cool. Um, so what's amazing about the 3D printer is you can give this thing a design and then the printer will actually manufacture an object. We also call these things object printers, okay? And for me, it's really crazy. You know, again, I grew up in the 90s. I grew up watching uh, Star Trek. I don't know if you guys have watched Star Trek before. Um, so they had this thing in Star Trek, um, which is called a replicator, all right? And this thing I thought was hilarious because literally, you know, I grew up watching this thing and now it's like real. So I'll show, I'm just going to play you guys a little video from YouTube. This is Star Trek right here. Tomato soup. There are 14 varieties of tomato soup available from this replicator with rice, with vegetables, foley in style, with pasta, with plain. Specify hot or chilled. Hot. Hot, plain tomato soup. All right, so you finally got a tomato soup. So what's crazy about that is, you know, we kind of, you know, I kind of grew up with this idea. Oh yeah, there's a machine. You go and say, hey, I want this thing, and then all of a sudden, boom, the machine makes it for you and pops it out. Well, we live in that world now, and this is one of the things that, um, I, you know, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this today, but um, I use these object printers, these 3D printers, these replicators to help me make the microfluidic devices that you saw. Okay, so it's kind of a tool that I need to help me make my other tools that I use for synthetic biology. So it's a whole chain of these things. But I want to spend just a, I want to close out to show you one other video. You guys have already seen this before, but um, it's really amazing, and I think is uh, um, again for for uh, for what you guys in terms of the, the types of projects you guys are envisioning and dreaming about. Um, this is a concept that I think is really powerful and amazing. So I'll close out with this little uh, just two quick videos on on 3D printers. So maybe you've heard about the MakerBot Replicator 2 desktop 3D printer, but you don't know how it works. It's cool. I'm Brie Pettis, CEO of MakerBot, and I'm going to walk you through the MakerBot creation process. The MakerBot Replicator 2 desktop 3D printer is the easiest, fastest, and most affordable tool for making professional quality models. If you're an engineer, or an engineer at heart, you can keep a MakerBot Replicator 2 desktop 3D printer right on your desktop and produce amazing, high-quality models while you work. The MakerBot creation process starts with a digital design. This can be a design that you create using any digital modeling program, or you can download one of thousands of models from our site, Thingiverse.com. Thingiverse is a community forum where people, like you, can share their digital designs. There are over 25,000 things on Thingiverse, and most of them can be made on a MakerBot Replicator 2 desktop 3D printer. And the best part? They're all free. Once you've got your digital design, the next step is to open it in MakerBot MakerWare. This is the software that allows you to prepare your model to be made on your MakerBot Replicator 2. MakerBot MakerWare is a brand new software tool developed right here at MakerBot. You can use MakerBot MakerWare to move and scale your model and to arrange it just so on the virtual build plane. When you've got it just how you want it, just press Make It and the MakerBot Replicator 2 desktop 3D printer will begin transforming your digital 3D model into a physical 3D model. This thing's crazy. The material that the MakerBot Replicator 2 desktop 3D printer uses is a renewable bioplastic called PLA. When you tell the MakerBot Replicator 2 to make something, it begins by pulling the PLA filament that's spooled in the back, up through this tube, and into the extruder. The extruder heats it up and squishes it through a very small hole onto the build plate. It starts by laying down the bottom layer of the 3D model. Then the platform moves the object down a tiny bit so the extruder can lay down the second layer. The process continues for the next layer, and the next layer, and the next layer. This process can take some time because each layer can be as fine is 100 microns. When you're done, you'll have a professional quality model that doesn't require any sanding or finishing. Now you know how the MakerBot Replicator 2 desktop 3D printer works, and it's time to set your mind in motion thinking about how you're going to use yours and what you're going to do. Whether you're an engineer, an industrial designer, a researcher, or just somebody who likes to make things, the MakerBot Replicator 2 can help bring your ideas to life. Wow. MakerBot, crazy. So um, again, what's really amazing about this machine is you give it a, a digital design and it just makes an object for you. 
And so what I do in my lab basically is I use this to tools like this to help make my microfluidic devices. Because actually my goal is I want all of you guys to be making microfluidic devices too. Right now it's actually really difficult to make them. There's a whole process called photolithography. Basically actually the process to make the, uh, the, uh, um, the circuit in your phone inside this thing it's actually um, a similar process we use to mic make microfluidics, and it's not easy. So a lot of what I'm trying to do in my research lab now is actually use tools like this so that um, students like you can actually start playing with microfluidics and actually start creating and building um, interesting microfluidic devices using a simple tool like this. Um, I'm going to close with one final quick little, another, uh, another um, just different type of 3D printing technology. Um, these are some of my friends from the, the MIT Media Lab that actually made this tool. And there's another kind of cool video to show you how this process of manufacturing um, arbitrary objects from the design um, can happen. I'll show this to you really quick here. What you can actually design and what you can actually make. And I think the Formlabs printer provides an exciting opportunity to be able to design and then physically make quickly precise, complex geometry. So this is another printer called the Form 1. They're going to be able to get really pro quality 3D printed parts way cheaper, way faster than they've ever been able to do that before. Formlabs takes us a giant step closer. Designers, engineers, material scientists to make a tightly integrated product. If you can do that, you can fundamentally change 3D printing. And I think we've done exactly that. Stereolithography is great to try to improve process. It's been around for well over 25 years. It produces the best quality parts in the industry. The way it works is pretty simple. A laser beam is drawn across the surface cool of a liquid plastic resin that hardens when exposed to a specific wavelength of light. After the layer is drawn, the build platform lifts and the process is repeated layer by layer until the part is finished. We have a great user experience. We have... So I just wanted to show you that, that as another little, another example of a 3D printing technology. Um, that we use. You guys want one, right? Actually, what's, what's, what's really amazing is um, this uh, this particular uh, printer is about two thousand dollars, okay? Yeah. Which is expensive, which is really expensive. But I mean, my computer costs more than that. So, um, you know, you're, you're, we're starting to get to a place now where really these tools are going to be part of your your home. It's going to be like a microwave. You know, eventually these things are going to be cheap enough that literally you'll have a machine like this in your house just to make objects for you. So, um, with that, guys, I am. Uh, We'll conclude right there. So thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, I got a bunch of different ways you guys can uh, um, keep up with me or stay in touch. Um, I got my photography up here, some DJ stuff, and then um, I actually have never tweeted before ever in my life, but um, you know, I put that up there anyways. You guys can uh, see that. So anyways, thank you guys so much for your time. I'll hang around with you.